All right, I am back after my stream had crashed on me, which is very annoying. It actually wasn't the stream. It was, once again, Sony, and I'm guessing their crappy OS, because it can't be the game that's the problem when it's literally every single game that crashes. This is a recurring problem. Moreover, it crashed in the climactic fight with Saren. Screw you, Sony. Screw you. For anybody that shows up, however, uh, as always, if you like what you see, click that follow button, and please feel free to check out my link for the GoFundMe for my friend who is getting a kidney replacement. We're going to jump straight into this fight because I'm mad enough at Sony for it crashing on me in the first place. And, uh, yeah, let's go see if we can kick some Saren ass. Come on, stand still. He's gonna summon ads here in a second. Yo, ow. All right, the first round of ads are here on the radar. There they are. So you guys focus on the ads. I'll focus on ugly. Okay, now it's not going to let me zoom in. That's even more annoying. There we go. Why can't I zoom and fire or any of that fun stuff? Okay, fine. The Geth don't stop. No. My poor frigates. My poor cruisers. Sovereign's too strong. We have to pull back. Negative. This is our only chance. Take that monster down no matter what the cost. Yeah. 
Yo. That was really a terrible time to stand right in my way, guys. Yo. Maybe bringing Garrus into this fight was a terrible idea. Because every time I turn around, all I see is a Turian. <laughs> and he's even currently the same colors as the frickin' bad guy. Frickin' shock trooper. Recharge my shot. More allies. Damn it. Saren is so close to dead. Got him. Good gravy. At least later bosses in this game will stand still when you're fighting them. It actually chance. doesn't make sense that, to Get me, that Sovereign gun. turned him into that kind of husk thing. Like, he's jumping around like a Geth stalker. Like, why would Sovereign copy Geth technology in him? Hard on my flank. We're going in. From a game design standpoint, it makes total sense. From lore standpoint, not so much. Go! Should have read the codex entries before all this fight happened. Since there's that literally that one panel left. That's alright. We saved the day. I'll read the codex entries, which will make an excuse to make the stream longer than it needs to be. After the fact. Since, you know, this fight took all of ten minutes. Safe now. Where's the commander? 
He's in there somewhere. She's in there somewhere. Because you don't fuck with Shepard. Now for the epilogue. Ambassador, Captain, Commander Shepard. We have gathered here to recognize the enormous contributions of the Alliance forces in the war against Sovereign and the Geth. Many humans lost their lives in the battle to save the Citadel. Brave and courageous soldiers who willingly gave their lives so that we, the Council, might live. There is no greater sacrifice, and we share your grief over the tragic loss of so many noble men and women. The Council also owes you a great personal debt, Commander, one we can never repay. You saved not just our lives, but the lives of billions from Sovereign and the Reapers. Commander Shepard, your heroic and selfless actions serve as a symbol of everything humanity and the Alliance stand for. And though we cannot bring back those valiant soldiers who gave their lives to save ours, we can honor their memories through our actions. Humanity has shown it is ready to stand as a defender and protector of the galaxy. You have proved you are worthy to join our ranks and serve beside us on the Citadel Council. Counselor, on behalf of Humanity and the Alliance, we thank you for this prestigious honor and humbly accept. We will need a list of potential candidates to fill Humanity's seat on the Council. Given all that has happened, I am sure your recommendation will carry a great deal of weight, Commander. Do you support any particular candidate? We need someone with the courage to stand up for what he believes in. Someone like Captain Anderson. Him? You must be joking. Anderson prefers to let his fists do the talking. Only with you, Ambassador. Only with you. <laughs> are you sure about this, Commander? The Captain's a soldier, not a politician. We've already got too many politicians on the Citadel. The Captain would be perfect for this job. I think it's an inspired choice. The Council would welcome him with open arms, should he accept. I'm honored, Council. As Humanity's representative, I'll do everything in my power to help the Council rebuild. Sovereign's defeat marks the beginning of a new era for both Humanity and the Council. Sovereign was only a vanguard. The Reaper fleet is still coming. Hundreds of ships, maybe thousands. And I'm gonna find some way to stop them. I kind of like that she doesn't wait around for them to argue with her. Shepard's right. Humanity is ready to do its part. United with the rest of the Council, we have the strength to overcome any challenge. When the Reapers come, we must stand side by side. We must fight against them as one. And together, we will drive them back into dark space. It's Mass Effect 1 beat. Which is a good sign. I still gotta read that codex entry if it'll ever make it through this part, which I think is just the start of the credits. If I were a gentleman, I'd let the credits run. Note how quickly that I let them go on. <laughs> zoom so that I can read my codex entry and once those codex entries are done that's the end of Mass Effect 1 guys Whoop. 
There's a primary one I missed. Like the oh. ancient human city of Troy, Ilos is a world known only through secondhand sword. Wait a minute. That music is too loud. I can't even hear it. Ah. Uh, it was Planets and Locations, Ilos. The ancient human city of Troy. Ilos is a world known only through second-hand sources. References to Ilos have been found at several other Prothean ruins, though direct study of the world is unlikely to occur. Ilos lies in a remote area of the Terminus systems, only accessible by the legendary Mew Relay. 4,000 years ago, the Mew Relay was knocked out of position by a supernova and lost. Since then, Ilos and its cluster have been inaccessible. Occasionally, a university will organize an expedition to chart a route to Ilos using conventional FTL drive. These never get beyond the planning stages due to the distance and danger. The journey could take years or decades, passing through the hostile Terminus systems and dozens of unexplored systems. All right, Ilos is now red. Alien Council races, Solarian government. I need Solarian military doctrine. Okay. Solarian government is called the Solarian Union. It is a labyrinthine web of matrilineal bloodlines with political alliances formed through interbreeding. In many ways, the Solarian political network functions like the noble families of Earth's medieval Europe. Structurally, the government consists of fiefdoms, baronies, duchies, planets, and marches, colonization, which are colonization clusters. These are human nicknames. The original Solarian is unpronounceable. Each area is ruled by a single Dalatras, which is a matriarchal head of household, and represents an increasing amount of territory and prestige within the Solarian political web. Approaching 100 members, the first circle of a Solarian's clan comprises parents, siblings, uncles, aunts, and cousins. The next circle includes second cousins, etc., and escalates to well over 1,000 members. The fourth or fifth circle of a clan numbers into the millions. Solarian loyalty is greatest to the first circle and diminishes from there. Their photographic memories allow Solarians to recognize all their myriad relatives. They can recognize their one million different relatives. Holy guacamole. Um, it was Solarian military doctrine. In principle, the Solarian military is similar to the Alliance, a smaller volunteer army that focuses on maneuver warfare. What differentiates the Solarians is not their equipment or doctrine, but their intelligence services and rules of engagement. The Solarians believe in a, that a war should be won before it even begins. Conventional wisdom holds that the Solarians know everything about everyone, and this is not far from the truth. In war, the unquestioned superiority of their intelligence service allows them to use their small military to maximum effectiveness. Well before fighting breaks out, they possess complete knowledge of their enemy's positions, intentions, and timetable. In every war the Solarians have fought, they struck first and without warning. For the Solarians, to know an enemy plans to attack and to let it happen is folly. To announce their own plans to attack is insanity. They find the human moral concepts of do not fire until fired upon and declare a war before prosecuting it incredibly naive. In defensive wars, they execute devastating preemptive strikes hours before the enemy's own attacks. On the offense, they have never telegraphed their intentions with a declaration of war before attacking. Biotics are virtually unknown in the Solarian military. Those with such abilities are considered too valuable to be used as cannon fodder and are assigned to the intelligence services. Now that I think about it, I don't know that we ever see a Solarian biotic in these games. While capable of defending themselves against most threats, the Solarians know that they are a small fish in a universe, in a universe filled with sharks. As a point of survival, they have cultivated strong alliances with larger powers, particularly with the Turians. Though the relationship between the two species was rocky at first due to the Krogan uplift fiasco, the Solarians take pains to keep this relationship strong enough that anyone who might threaten them risks Turian intervention. Alright, which brings us to our last, very last codex entry. Upgrades. The development of practical manufacturing omni-tools allows modern militaries a great deal of flexibility in equipment loadouts. A vast number of field modification kits or upgrades are available for common equipment such as weapons, armor, omni-tools, biotic amps, and even grenades. An upgrade kit typically consists of less than a dozen unique parts and an optical storage disk. When loaded into an Omni-Tool, the OSD provides all technical specifications required to manufacture the tools and additional parts necessary to install the upgrade onto another piece of equipment. 
Assembly is typically modular, and installation can be completed in less than a minute. Since Omni tools are designed to use common battlefield savage materials such as plastic, ceramics, and light metals, rendered into semi molten Omni gel for quick use, it is quite possible for a trained soldier carrying upgrade kits to customize gear on the battlefield to fit their current tactical situation. Well, there you go. The game was beat. We did it. Thank you for sticking with me through the 40 hours or so of gameplay that we had. And I appreciate all of you. Join us later tonight, hopefully, as I continue to stream some Magic the Gathering. Hopefully I'll be on later tonight. Otherwise, join me Friday as I start the second Mass Effect in the series, Mass Effect 2, and we learn what Cerberus has gotten up to in between the games, as well as take the fight to the collectors that have been kidnapping human colonies in the time that we were gone. Once again, I appreciate everybody. If you like what you've seen, please feel free to click the follow button or the subscribe button wherever these VODs are available, and I will catch you all next time.